Alright, hello everyone. So, welcome to my video. I'm going to be commentating and analyzing my recent 45 heat clear, but the run is going to have to go by pretty quickly for a few reasons, so I'm recording a brief intro to cover a few basic concepts and strategies so I don't have to explain them during the run. So, my weapon of choice for this is the Aspect of Hestia for the rail. The gimmick with this weapon is that if you manually reload, which I have bound to left trigger, your next shot does very large base damage. 150 at base. So, my strategy for the whole run is basically just running around, power shotting, and reloading constantly. Alright, there you are. So, yeah. You can see how much damage it does, and also, very relevantly, the shot has much higher range than than the normal rail shot, so it's one of the safest aspects in the game, because I can stand, like, this far away and still hit things for maximum damage, so that's most of the logic behind why I'm using this weapon. To look at the Pact of Punishment I'm using, a lot of it's self-explanatory, max hard labor, enemies hit twice as hard, convenience fee, jury summons. Lasting consequences is very important here, as it means I cannot heal at all through fountains or anything like that. Benefits package, middle management, underworld customs are all like pretty standard. I only have one level of force overtime because f double force overtime is just very hard with everything else turned on. Heightened security, I can't use damage control with Hestia, some weapons don't really care about it, but because I have a low attack rate, I absolutely cannot take any damage control. One approval process, it sucks, I hate playing with approval process. Some, I did used to do some attempts with a pact like this one, literally just because I didn't like playing with approval process, because it removes options and it just makes it luckier. But realistically, it is easier to just play it like this and just hope for better RNG as opposed to, like, making everything harder. <laughs> In a way... So, that's the basics. The two most important things for the pact are Maximum Tight Deadline and Extreme Measures 4. If you want to do 45 heat, don't do Extreme Measures 4. This makes it very significantly harder because the final boss is just that difficult with EM4 on, so this is not recommended. I just wanted to because it's cooler, and it did make this much more like satisfying to overcome doing it with this. But yeah, <laughs> probably don't unless you really want to like I did. Yeah, and no routine inspection, because losing the mirror is horrible. Like, you don't take this unless you're doing, like, more than 50 heat or something. Tight deadline is what I was talking about as... It's, it's kind of the most important, because it kind of dictates how a lot of other things work. Tight deadline does work based on the in-game timer, which does have a few things that will stop it. Most notably, like, whenever you're picking a boon, like, you're in the menu of a boon or a palm, the timer will not be running. Or any, like, cutscenes with characters, it'll pause. And in story rooms like Sisyphus, Eurydice, Patroclus. But because we only have five minutes per zone, I basically have to take every mid shop and story room and chaos gate that I see because those still advance the chamber number, I'm still getting closer to the boss and the end of the run, but those don't involve fighting any enemies, so they're just always faster. So that is why you'll see me always taking the mid-shop, even if I don't have enough money to afford anything, I just have to for the sake of the timer. And also, the in-game timer will be paused while the game is paused in general, so you will also see me regularly just pausing the game while the doors are loading, so anytime I'm thinking of which door I want to go to, the timer isn't ticking down, because 
five minutes per zone is not that much, and I need all the time I can get, so I pause the game at various points, mostly for a tight deadline. Last thing I want to talk about in this here is the mirror. Now to give me strength. Shadow Presence for backstab damage is better for boss fights. With Hestia, Fiery Presence isn't really wrong, because, you know, it has such a high base damage, so 75% more is quite strong. For a lot of my runs, I was starting with Athena's Dash, and I had to use Fiery Presence in order to keep up in Tartarus. I just needed to get those one-shots to make it through with the timer. But, maybe I should have talked about this first, but for this run I'm starting with Aphrodite's Keepsake, because she has the strongest attack boon, percentage-wise. And when I have that, I don't need the damage. And Shadow Presence getting backstabs is much better for boss fights, because, I mean, you're not going to be close to one-shotting any of them anyway, so... It gets more damage over the course of boss fights. This literally doesn't matter, you can't heal with lasting consequences. Stubborn Defiance is very important here. Because you can't heal at fountains, or with Hydrolite, or anything from the wells, basically the only reliable way to recover HP is through Stubborn Defiance. So, you'll see me at many points even intentionally die in lava or to a trap, so that I can get the revive back and restore back to 30% health, even if I'm running on like 2 HP. So. You, you kind of just have to take like this, this over Death Defiances, because this just isn't enough. Like, yeah, if you're using all four Lasting Consequences so you can't heal, you pretty much have to take Stubborn Defiance just to, like, have any chance. <laughs> Greater Reflex obviously is infinitely better than Ruthless Reflex. You never use Ruthless Reflex unless you're playing Gilgamesh. Boiling Blood is just better doing more damage. This is something I kind of forget to do a lot of the time, but, you know, doing more damage, especially, again, on such a high base damage like Hestia attack, it's just good. Stygium Soul is, like, a micro-optimization. If you're, like, actually using casts, Infernal Soul is, like, often better. But with Stygian Soul, literally the difference is... Hermes has one less boon he can offer if you're using Stygian Soul, so having this on gives me a very slightly higher chance to get things I actually want, like extra dashes or hyper sprint, so it doesn't matter that much, but it's just a small thing. Deep Pockets and Thick Skin are obvious, just getting money and 50 extra base health is much more useful than the other things. Family Favorite is good. Privilege Status isn't great. I mean, depending on what build you're using, it might be better, but for my build, just having more damage always is better. Dark Foresight is infinitely better than Olympian Favor. Just more boons, palms, and stuff is always going to be better. God's Pride, because there's not any duo boons I want, so just higher boon rarity. And Faded Persuasion is always better than Faded Authority. You never use Faded Authority. And that is basically all the basics covered. Sorry if that was a little dense, but some of that, especially the tight deadline stuff, is just important to cover because I'm not going to have time to discuss the little things like that during the run. So, alright, now I will jump over to the actual successful run and commentate over that now that we have the basics covered. So... To start the run itself, we are starting, maybe surprisingly, on a death screen. The reason for this, why we have to look at this first, is just to prove that this is an unseated run. This run is unseated and unmodded. It's a little complicated, but basically, showing a death just proves that I don't know anything about the run beforehand. If I didn't show a death, I might have already known like what boon was in the first chamber and stuff. Not going to get into more detail than that. So, an unmodded is also... It's mostly, I think, in speedrunning, but sometimes in high heat, too, people will use mods to, like, guarantee their first boon and hammer, which just, like, reduces randomness and just lets you get on runs faster, which is nice. But this run is not using any of that. I already discussed my pact and all. <laughs> earlier. You have a tendency to ask too many questions, so, getting into the run for real, starting with Aphrodite's keepsake, because 
her attack, it does the most damage. The weak is kind of a nice thing to counteract hard labor, but really the reason is just for the very high attack damage. Scales very well with high base damage like Hestia. Have to roll it once, but getting epic is amazing. That's, I mean, it is quite literally the best thing I could hope for. <laughs> Chaos Gate, both first speed, and also just because Chaos is good. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna pause a bit here. I, if I didn't mention, I'm gonna link the raw footage. You can watch it unedited in the description if you want, but to explain a couple things. <laughs> These first two Chaos Boons are terrible. I, like, can't take any of those. Like, the benefits aren't good, and taking damage when I attack is not an option. <laughs> So, I think about it for a second, but I have to roll it. Hey, got anything else? And dash strike damage is fine, because I don't use the special too much. I also fish here, I'm just gonna skip past this. <laughs> but yeah. Hestia is good, because you kind of want to dash strike a lot anyway, so that, like, getting a dash strike bonus is almost as good as, like, a general attack bonus. Same thing with, like, backstabs, like, there's a lot of good things you can get from Chaos. Hitting the Nectar right away is also really nice, because I only have one boon, the palm is guaranteed to go on my attack, which is excellent to get so early on. This room's funny, because th these damage control numbskulls are, like, basically the worst enemy that could possibly spawn for Hestia. This is, like, basically the only time in the run you're gonna see me actually use the normal spray attack a little bit, instead of just the power shot, because I just need to get through all these damage controls, that because this numbs will spawn it so much. It's kind of a rough room to start, I'm already down to 5 health, but because of the stubborn, my health doesn't matter that much, as long as it's not zero. <laughs> So, rough room to start off with, but, I mean, we're still very happy with an epic attack, so. I guess I could also mention there was the Erebus Gate in the past last room, which isn't really worth it, like, hardly ever. I mean, there are probably cases, but they're risky, so I don't bother. These enemies that, like, spawn the clones can be a bit annoying for the auto-aim, but it's fine. Chaos has been lifted. Ricochet fire here is the ideal hammer. It's... It can be a little inconsistent, but just getting the massive damage of the Hestia attack on multiple things at once, it just makes the run a whole lot faster. You can probably see it a bit in this room, just seeing it bounce around, and it's almost like I'm getting two attacks for one. So that's very good. This right here is a little rough. I don't really want Tidal Dash because I want Athena's Dash later in the run. But I can't sell Sunken Treasure, so I have to take Tidal Dash pretty much unless I want to roll, which I don't. So, Tidal Dash is good. It's just a little... It's gonna kind of suck if I can't sell it, because that's just not how I'm used to playing. Though, I mean, it's not, like, wrong or bad. You definitely, like, could play this based around Tidal Dash, but that's not how I'm planning to go about it. Yeah, here, you can really see how much Ricochet Fire just makes us go a whole lot faster. As I said, it's the best hammer I could ask for. If I wasn't going for Rocket Bomb... Like, Rocket Bomb and getting, like, Triple or Cluster Bomb along with it, like, is also a way to go that's very strong, but if Rocket Bomb's not offered, then, offered, then Ricochet Fire is the best thing I could ask for. I'm getting it first is really nice, because it just helps me build up more of a time buffer for the later parts of the run. Getting a Fountain Chamber, obviously, is nice, and it doesn't heal me, but just free Chamber is good. You... Don't even really consider trials there. My timer is perfectly fine, but it's not amazing, so... Trials, like, they're good, but also they're risky, because they tend to take a long time, so I didn't feel like risking it there. Don't think there's too much else to mention here, 
it this further on. It's pretty simple. <laughs> Delicious. Palming the attack is always nice. Delicious. This is one interesting thing about how approval process works, is it will remove, at level 1, it will remove a choice, but if you only have two choices, it won't cross any out, which is really nice. And that actually is a bit relevant later, I, you will see later in the run, I'll like, take a palm at a certain point when I know I only have two booms, so I can guarantee palm the attack. At this point, this is Chamber 12, so that's the final shop, so the Chaos Gate wouldn't skip a chamber or anything. Not buying Zeus there, is, like, might be a mistake. I, it probably was, considering I only have Title Dash to sell. But at the same time, like, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not really sure if that was the right decision or not, because I want to sell Title Dash anyway, so, like, in a sense, it wouldn't really have mattered. But I'm not sure about that, don't like. <laughs> Feel free to judge me if you think that's wrong. <laughs> it is kind of risky having, like, I only have the two boons, so. It's not the best situation. Clean Electo fight. One minute on the clock is pretty average. Some runs I'm getting out there with, like, five seconds on tight deadline. I think once I made it out with, like, two minutes. I don't know how that happened, but it did. <laughs> So I only have two boons, I have to purge the title dash, which is fine, because again, I want Athena's dash anyway, you'll see me pick up her keepsake now, because that safety is just really good. First Hermes here. Missed a gold pot. I'm not the greatest at noticing all the gold pots, but yeah. You can see, I am a little, like, rough with Hestia sometimes. I just, like, don't perfectly have the timings for, the, like, the reloading and dashing all down. Greatest reflex, obviously. Extra dashes is just very good, always, for mobility. I have plenty of money, so I'm just looking to take the health. These armored skull piles can be annoying. They're a pretty rare enemy, but I mean, it doesn't matter that much. You can't really see, like, Ricochet Fire putting into work at a lot of these. Now here. This is a hard choice. I pause here for a while, because Midshot versus Eurydice. It's unfortunate that they're both being offered at the same time. Since they're both free rooms, you would ideally have them, like, after each other. So, yeah, so it doesn't help in terms of the chamber number. This is a bit of a hard decision because I literally have two boons right now, so I kind of need boons to sell for Underworld Customs. So taking the shop would be correct in that point, but in the end I do decide that Eurydice is just way too good to pass up because of the Ambrosia. Usually I hate taking the Ambrosia because it's only two boons. It's like often like not very likely to actually hit the things you want. But I literally have two boons, so it is completely guaranteed to hit the attack and give me another extra dash charge. And that is way too good to pass up. Because yeah. I'm pretty sure the difference between, like, a heroic and epic is usually pretty big, so that is very massive for just my damage output in the entire run. I probably should have used my Meg Summon here. I'm not entirely sure why I didn't. It's probably just because, I mean, I'm usually not very good at actually hitting all the witches with Meg, but... <laughs> 
I probably still should have done it anyway. It would have helped a bit. And I don't actually use Meg that much this run, because I just, I guess I, I think I skip at least a mini boss or something like that, so I end up with, like, a lot of them. Yeah. We have Divine Dash now, the best boon in the game. <laughs> Period. The safety is just impossible to argue with. So, we are kind of cruising. It, the situation is a bit sketchy with Underworld Custom, because I have so few boons, but what I have is very good. Now we're going for another Athena. Athena is very good. This is something people might not realize, but she does have those two boons that can give you an extra... that can replenish a Death Defiance if you've lost one. You might not think that would work with Stubborn Defiance, but it actually does, as long as you actually lose your Stubborn Defiance. And so you'll see me in a second here, I will just intentionally kill myself in the lava before I pick up the Athena Boon, so that I can potentially get that Death Defiance. So interestingly, this is actually a net loss of health. I definitely wasn't even thinking about at the time, but it is incredibly worth it to have this extra Death Defiance, especially because it goes after my Stubborn Defiance, so it's not going to be used up unless I die a second time in the same chamber. And I end up carrying that Death Defiance all the way to the final boss, and it helps me win that final boss fight. So I have to sell whatever this one gives me, unfortunately, because you can't sell the Death Defiance boons, but yeah. I have longed to hear the sound of your hiss, Lenny. Here's where I start to like actually remember to utilize boiling blood. <laughs> which is something I kinda forget about a lot. I also just stand in that head slam for some reason. Don't ask me why. <laughs> I think not much to really talk about with Lurney. Pretty normal fight. <laughs> Ricochet fire does help a lot, especially right here you can see it's just hitting those things. Makes the timer look a whole lot better. And there we go. Three minutes on the deadline is good. Asphodel is a shorter biome than Tartarus, so you'll pretty much always gain some amount of time. I'm making sure to pop the Stubborn here, because I had 5 health. And it's easier to lose your Stubborn in Asphodel than Elysium. So I just want to make sure I'm going on full health into the first room of Elysium. Have to sell Blinding Flash, it's the only choice there. Now we're switching over to Charon's Capesake, because it, it's just very good. <laughs> like, I do take the movement speed, which I mean isn't that significant, but getting one of the Stubborn Defiance buffs, or like an attack jerky, or anything like that, and having it last like through the whole biome is very strong. Here's where I start to like actually remember I have four dashes. <laughs> I kind of like forgot about that in Asphodel, and honestly, probably Elysium too. But I start actually taking use of it here. These popper enemies can be annoying. It's not too bad. It's like the first chamber, so there's not as many enemies. But I've some runs you just have like seven blue guys that all pop at once, and there's like. <laughs> literally just 30 souls flying around and it's chaos. So this is also what I mentioned earlier where I only have two palmable boons so I just take the palm over the hammer. Partly because the hammer is very likely to be offered again, just that's how hammers work. So, I'd rather take the palm while I know I can palm the attack, because, uh, <laughs> minor spoilers, I do get kind of fucked over on palms, like, multiple times later in the run, and it doesn't let me palm the attack, but... Taking the guarantee there is nice. So, 
seeing all the blue men is a little annoying. Something to talk about, because some of these Elysium chambers are pretty slow. Don't, like, quote me on this, I don't exactly know how this works, but my approximate understanding is that there's basically... Okay, hold on. <laughs> First, I should talk about this hammer. Hazard Bomb is probably technically better, just because, you know, big damage good. But I've never really, like, used Hazard Bomb, so, like, I wasn't really... I didn't want to try to adjust to how it worked on the fly. So, I take targeting system here. Maybe not correct, but it's what I went with. <laughs> yeah, anyway, the thing I wanted to talk about a moment ago is my basic understanding is each Hades room will have, like, a certain amount of points you need to fulfill. And, of course, different enemies are worth different points. So, in terms of speed and, like, dealing with the timer, you kind of want to see more armored enemies and just bigger enemies, like the big chariots, because they're worth more points, so there will be less enemies in the room. So, you kind of don't want to see all the blue men, because, you know, they aren't worth that many points, so you get swarmed a lot more. So, I mean, there's not really anything you can do about that, but it's just a interesting fun fact to consider. We're not fighting Charon, obviously. <laughs> What even was that door I picked? I think it's... Oh yeah, it's just a palm. I do skip the mini-boss in Elysium, which, I mean, I don't know. I probably should have taken Ares for something else to sell. I mean, I kind of was in a bit of a... I was maybe tunnel-visioning a bit too much on, like, the build I have is good, let's just make it better, rather than, like, get useless things. But, I mean, Underworld Customs is a thing. I kind of should have been thinking about that a bit more. So yeah, unlucky I can't palm the attack, but I mean, it's not the end of the world. And here is where we get Patroclus. Patty is massive in a run with this much heat, because this buff makes your Stubborn Defiance last for, I believe it restores you for like 80% health instead of 30%, so that is a massive deal. Like, if it's not obvious how much that, how important that is, it like, yeah, it's so much more health. And especially because I saw him near the end of Elysium, I'm able to maintain that buff all the way into the Hades fight, which gives me significantly more health to work with throughout that fight. So, yeah, you always want to see Patty if you're using Stubborn. It's like, not just because it's a free chamber, but, like, that benefit is so, such a big deal. This room's a little annoying with the flame wheels, but, I mean, it's, they're not that big of a deal. They're not, like, that threatening, they're just a pain. Lose the stubborn there, but again, you can see, I almost wanted to lose the stubborn here, because I'm pretty sure this is the last combat chamber, so... I would have made sure to proc the stubborn anyway, so I can have as much health as I can going into heroes. Hermia's here. Quick recovery wouldn't necessarily be, like, that stupid to take. It does, despite lasting consequences, that is a rare source of it would still restore your health after that. But, I mean, it's just not that great of a boon in general, so I roll here. Let's see what else. And I end up with Hyper Sprint, which is kind of overkill when I already have extra dashes, but it's better than any of the other several things that got offered. Scammed on the attack once again, so... Unfortunate, but it's not the end of the world. So, 
I think, yeah, this is literally the first time I used Make the Run, which is kind of stupid. But, really good setup. I'll rewind a second ago. As soon as you gain control after exiting this, tap directly up, like, with your keyboard or D-pad, like, don't try to approximate, and hit Meg immediately, and it will hit them both very consistently. So, nice little trick, and it's kind of part of why Meg is good, is it just comes out a lot faster than other companions. So it's a lot easier to, like, get setups to, like, hit multiple enemies with Meg. Which I think is mostly why I, <laughs> I and everyone else uses it. To be quite real, like, every, like, speedrun and, like, high heat run I've, like, ever seen in my life just uses Meg. And I've, like, never really used one of the other companions. Because <laughs> Meg is just what I believe to be the best based on every run ever. I'm sure there is some, like, tech or uses for the other ones, but Meg is the simplest. As always, you wanna, if you can, just rush down Theseus before he starts, like, moving. It's usually not too hard to avoid the, like, initial attack as he changes phase. So yeah, this is where not having enough boons kind of comes to bite me in the ass, because I really, really don't want to sell any of those, so I have to roll the well, which is rough. You don't really want to have to do that, but <laughs> I need I really did need, like, all of those. So, getting rid of Hydraulic Might. And here's another huge thing about Charon. You can take the well before you change your keepsake, and, again, that Cyclops jerky is going to last all the way to Hades, which helps, a, I mean, not like a crazy amount, but it definitely helps. And the Acorn, because it's the best defensive keepsake in the game, if you didn't know. Please use the Acorn for the final boss. It helps a lot. So yeah, a full 8 minutes on the timer is very good. I made very good time throughout Asphodel and Elysium, so... Timer's looking great. I could probably win even with, like, a 3-sack, in terms of the timer at least. But, I mean, probably not really surprising I do get a 2-sack this run. <laughs> One interesting thing you may or may not know is I am... You always go for the mini-boss doors in this context, because, I mean, they're debatably just easier, but they're undebatably faster. So because of Tight Deadline, I'm making sure to go to the mini-boss doors, because they just take less time to kill, and you get the much better reward. It is kind of lucky this run to have a double palm and a double health as the two mini-boss doors, because, I mean... Now that we're past all the purging wells, I can keep everything, and the things I have are very good, so... Those are probably about the two most useful things I could get on the doors. Middle management makes a second boss. So, honestly, I so, like, YOLO the megs on these, like, all the time ever, but, you know, that would worked out perfectly and hit both of them, so good job me, I guess. Getting the double palm on the attack is obviously very good. Here I could have uh, gone into the two-sack mentality, where you 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 would always take a mini-boss on the first door, because the fir you can, can't get a one-sack. The first one will always be a normal room. So... But depending on, like, how the run was going, I might have taken a different door, kind of just hoping for a two-sack, if there was some boon, like, other boon that, like, would have helped a lot. In this particular case, like, health is probably the best thing I could get at this point anyway. So, I still go for the mini-boss door. But, yeah. Once you've done your first path, it could potentially be okay to just hope you get a two-sack and to avoid the normal combat rooms. Am 
I think this is the last one. So, yeah. <laughs> this run is obviously going very well. I have an entire six minutes on the clock for EM4 Dad, which is very good. So I believe at this point we go into the funny situation of a couple minutes of nothing here because I got up to go to the washroom. <laughs> So, I'm gonna skip through this, obviously. If you, for some unfathomable reason, want to watch this, bra footage will be in the description again. But yeah. Past that, <laughs> on to the final boss. I am definitely nervous at this point, because this build is very strong, and I this is the fastest time I've ever you gotten to this point on. Step farther past this threshold, boy. I guess fun stats to mention, I believe. I had ten deaths to final boss, and three of those were to the last phase, which was a little rough going for the attempts, but this run, the eleventh run reaching him, was our victory. So... I use Meg right away here, which isn't really optimal. It would be better to to use it after he spawns the second set of mini bosses at like one third health. But I kind of preferred. I just wasn't confident I would actually be able to hit him mid attack pattern, so I just take the guaranteed damage at the start. Which I mean, not optimal, but I mean it works out fine. First boss sneak is fine. The easiest one you want to see is like the skull crushers. They're the easiest to avoid. But sneak isn't too bad, especially with a ranged weapon like Hestia. Butterfly balls are the worst thing you could possibly see because they love to just like steal all your acorn charges. But I mean, at this point, I was out of acorn anyway, and I just have good enough damage to end the phase before they, like, bleed too much health. And also, having a thing of dash makes them less threatening, because they just get destroyed when I dash, which is most of my movement. You truly dare. Let's go. Phase 2, destroy the pots if you can. I get kind of bodied by that laser, but it's fine. This is really where I think having both weak and the thing I almost like forgot about is Hyper Sprint does make you take less damage right after you dash. So having those does help me stay alive a lot. These urns, yeah, so if you didn't know, these urns count as traps. And because I have heightened security on, this would normally hit me for 150 damage, which is very bad. <laughs> Go to the sides of the arena to avoid the Cerberus attack. That's just the only way to do it, really. Yeah, anyway. I'm pretty sure it was the, like, sturdy from Hyper Sprint saved me from taking quite so much damage from that one pot I ran into. I take the hit there, but that's, that's almost, like, the best time to take that hit, since... I'm kind of mind blanking, but since, like, I had low health anyway, so the fact that it was 150 doesn't really matter. Losing the stubborn there is fine, because, I mean, we're almost done. Well, this phase. Okay, so I genuinely, like, I just don't want to commentate this last phase... Because I just kind of want to leave this intense-ass finale. Just a couple tiny quick notes. One thing you can do with Ricochet Fire is if you shoot at the pillar, sometimes it can like ricochet into Dad, even while you're hiding from the lasers. So you'll see that happen in the final phase. And yeah. This is getting a little messy, but I really want to just let this last act speak for itself. So, enjoy.
And that is 45 heat. Extreme measures for clear. <laughs> so at this point, there's also just gonna be kinda nothing on the screen for a while, cause I'm like, running around my basement happy dancing. Cause... <laughs> this was a very hard challenge for me. I don't have like an exact time, but it was around roughly 18 hours, give or take, of grinding attempts to do this over the past week or so. So, I'm really happy that I got this run finally. It was hard, but it was fun. It's... <laughs> I don't know if I can recommend it to everyone, but it, it was really enjoyable for me. And, I mean, now we'll skip ahead to, a, to whenever I come back. Got you. And we can finally see this was my 100th Escape from Hell. It really worked out great for me that, like, basically every goal I ever wanted to do in Hades kind of so happened to work out with this milestone, too. Like, I did 20 heat on every weapon, I did, like, a certain speed with every weapon, I did my sub-10 speed run. I got a good win streak, and I mean, I finished the story and epilogue and everything. And to crown it all off, one big giant heat run <laughs> to really encapsulate it all the the big finale to Hades I'm sure I'll keep playing it sometimes but it's probably time for a break after this grinds so yeah that's me taking a screenshot of course and now me happy dancing in the game as well after real life so <laughs> You can tell I might be a little bit excited from this. And... This is a really funny dialogue to get on the escape. I, I distinctly remember, like, yeah, I believe this is a dream or something like that I, like, said out loud. But, yeah. That is... my Hades 45 heat run. Hope I... Hope the commentary wasn't too chaotic. I tried to... I didn't have an exact script, but I wrote out my notes about, like, roughly what I wanted to talk about. I think I covered it decently. Hopefully it was informative, maybe entertaining, if I'm lucky. So, yeah. Thanks for watching. Hope you have a good day. See you next time.